I want to welcome you all to the People's Church. I'm Shantia Monroe. I am the senior pastor here at the People's Church. And I have been given the uh, distinct pleasure to make the opening announcements and to welcome our guest speaker. It's so nice to have you all here. And I want to commend you on coming indoors on maybe the last good weekend for a long time. Uh, extra stars in your crown, so welcome. I welcome you to this, which is the annual Henry and Annabelle Larzolier Lecture. Um, this is a lecture series. It happens once a year in the fall that is named after a couple that were pillars of this church. Uh, Henry and Annabelle Larzolier were lifelong learners, people who were committed to putting their faith into action, people who believed in social justice before it was a hashtag, and uh, they have been a spirit that has continued to live in this church long since uh, they have both passed. So I'd like to thank the committee, the Larzalier Lecture Committee, which consists of John Larzalier and his wife, Marianne, who are so constitutive of this whole process. A big thanks to Carol and Sandy Bryson and also to Penny and Mike Swartz. I had people ask me today, so were you the one who got John Pavlovitz to come to the church? And it's like, no. I, would, I never in a million years thought we could get Elvis in the building. But um, <laughs> but this, this unstoppable committee of six people made it happen, and I am very grateful for the work of the uh, Henry and Annabelle Larzalier Lecture Committee. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to let you know that at the, the way this is going to work is that uh, John is going to give prepared remarks and then he's going to open it up for questions and answers. Um, I will be running around with a microphone, so if you could be patient and raise your hand so we can make that uh, something that everyone can participate in, more importantly everyone can hear, that would be great. And then we will close uh, with him bringing us back together with some final remarks. At the end of this conversation, uh, you can still buy uh, John Pavlovitz's books out in Friendship Hall, so make your way out there, and I am uh, told that he will be able to sign those books if that is something that you're interested in. So, the most important thing is what we're here for, and that is for me to introduce to you our annual Henry and Annabelle Larzalier lecture lecturer, who is John Pavlovitz, who is described on his website which you should all subscribe to, as a writer, a pastor, and an activist. But after today's sermon, I would also like to give him the title of role model, because I think he is modeling for a lot of thoughtful, faithful, anxious Christians the way to bring our faith into action and be present in the world so that we are game changers. He is committed to equality, diversity, and justice, both inside and outside faith communities. And he preached a powerful sermon, which if you missed it, I would commend it to you. You can watch that on our church's website uh, because it was an amazing sermon about turbulence is coming. As a mainline progressive Christian pastor, I am so delighted to introduce to you someone who is willing to fight with and for the faith tradition I love so well, and so it gives me just delight to introduce John Pavlovitz.
much better. There we go. Thank you. As I was saying, to be here in your presence, people who are lovers and helpers and healers and caregivers and activists and damn givers, and I just want to thank you because the work I do is very isolating. And I have the data that tells me that people are reading the writing. I intellectually understand that, but it is not until I get into a space with a group of human beings and actually realize the powerful connection that we have together. So I'm thankful for that. And I, I travel so much, and as I shared last night, I, I don't consider myself an author or a speaker or primarily a pastor even. I consider myself a collector of stories. I, I call myself a war correspondent because I get to be in a new community like this and I get into the trenches of life with people and I say, tell me what's happening here on the ground so that I can tell the folks back home. And when I do that, whether it's in person or on online, people give me access to their stories. They give me proximity to their pain. And they tell me the burdens and the struggles and the suffering. And as they tell me these stories, I try to be a faithful and responsible translator of those stories. And I try to ask, what are they trying to say that they might not have words for? I listen for the places that their voices shake. And I look at the pain that they're trying to convey. And then I report that back to the world. And so that's why I do what I do. I don't just share my burdens and my questions and my struggles and joys. But I try to relate those of other people so that they can become a hub around which we gather. So I hope that's been true for you. And I wanted to begin by asking a question. What's happening here on the ground in Michigan? We're going to pass the microphone later, but right now, just tell me what you're feeling or thinking or why you're here. What brought you in on this beautiful day to this spot? Who wants to just share? I'll repeat your answer. Why are you here? What's going on in your heart? What are you thinking, feeling? Yes. A need for inspiration. Okay. Yes. Too many jerks around. Too many jerks around. <laughs> Luckily, we barred the, them from coming in, so this is a jerk-free zone. <laughs> Unless you slip past, you know who you are. <laughs> Why else are you here? What are you thinking, feeling? Yes? I'm worried about the future of Christianity. Worried about the future of Christianity. Yes? I'm worried about the future of humanity. Worried about the future of humanity. Yes? Worried about your healthcare rights. Divisiveness, for or against it? <laughs> Depends, right? Well, there's a lot of heaviness in here, and if we had time, we, every single one of us could share the whys of our being here, but I think you're probably here because of your deep love for humanity and your worries about what is happening to it. So there's this, there's this question that I've often asked. I've been in ministry for 25 years as a local church pastor. And there's a question I often ask myself, and that question is, how did I end up here? So I've said that, I've asked that question in both beautiful and terrible ways. Um, I can remember being in, in a middle school lock-in as a youth pastor. Now, I don't know if you know what a lock-in is, but it's just what it sounds like. You get teenagers together, and you intentionally shut yourself in overnight with them. And I can remember being in a middle school lock-in, watching children dancing on the ceremonial piano that was donated in the name of another couple, and thinking, how did I end up here, right? <laughs> and I can remember being with a group of students in Pennsylvania, and we had taken them to a corn maze, because that's a fun thing to do in the fall, right? And we're walking through the corn maze, and we get to a clearing in the center of the corn maze, and there's a row of chairs, and a TV and a VCR, and a gentleman sits all my students down and puts on a badly produced movie with teenagers who are drinking and driving and they crash the car before they accept Jesus and they go to hell. And he says, if you want to get out of the maze of this life, you need to accept Jesus. And I realized I'd stumbled upon an evangelical corn maze. <laughs> and I thought, how did I end up here, right? 
Another time I was with a group of a few dozen students and we had traveled to our hotel in Greenville, South Carolina and we were checking in and they said, you're checked in in Greenville, California. And I thought, how did I end up here, right? And then I can remember being, getting a call from the police because a student had been arrested and she was one of my students and she listed me as the person that she wanted to talk to. And I walked in and thought, how did I end up here? And then I can remember sitting outside of the living room of two of my students and their mother had passed away and they had asked me to be the one to go and tell these young girls that they had lost their mother. And I thought, how did I end up here? So in both beautiful and terrible ways, I have asked that question. And I think every minister, every parent, every caregiver, every partner, every spouse has their how did I end up here moments, right? And I'm asking the church that question, how did we end up here? How did the church end up at this place being represented so many places by an ugly, predatory, exclusionary religion that bears no resemblance to Jesus? How is Christian nationalism what people think Christianity is? How did we end up here? And then I ask that question of our nation. How did we end up here? How is it 2022 and we're still debating the value of a black life? How are we still arguing over whether a woman should have autonomy over her own body or not? How are we still debating whether or not someone should be able to marry the person they love? How are we still so infected with racism and bigotry? And I think we have ended up here together because we have a poverty of empathy. I think there is a closed fistedness that is gripping so many people in our nation, even people who name Jesus as the center of their lives somehow. I think there is a growing contempt for the least of these. I think we are a compassion-deprived place, and I think that's why you're here, I think, because you feel the weight of that. But when I think of the, the answer to the question, how did I end up here, when I think of the best answer of how I ended up here, I think I ended up in the places I have because of compassion, because of an empathy that propels me into places I wouldn't otherwise go and surround me with people I would never meet any other way than because of the fact that I cared enough to seek their stories. I think that's what compassion does, friends. I think it moves us out of our comfort and into harm's way. And as a loving parent or a devoted friend or a faithful caregiver or a passionate activist, you are there because of a fierce love for humanity that pushes you into the jagged, messy trenches of people's lives that causes you to spend yourself on behalf of someone else, to give away something precious for someone. So today I want us to sit as we talk about a sustainable compassion. We're going to think about two wounds today. The wounds of the world and the wounds that you sustain caring for the wounds of the world. We're going to think about how you have a life that is propelled by empathy, that allows you to love the humanity in your path, but not become martyrs of our own hearts not to be overtaken by how much we care. Because there's a subtraction to compassion. I don't know if you know this, but there is a depletion that can come. And I wanted to talk about that because many of you today, you're dealing with, you're tired, you're dealing with frustration, apathy, maybe even burnout. You have what I call information poisoning. You just cannot take in any more bad news. Or you have cruelty sickness. You look at a group of people and you see the way that they're treating other people and it's making you ill. Not long after the 2016 election, I was talking to a friend and she said, 
doesn't anyone remember how to be a decent human being anymore? And I said, no. No, I said, yes. The problem is I think the people who know how to be decent human beings have either become exhausted or silent. And today what we want to do is realize that the exhaustion needs to be addressed and the silence needs to be addressed so that people looking around and saying, where are the good humans? We can say, here we are. Hope is not lost. I started writing about the people who care deeply like you, and I call them the damn givers. And I think you're here. I think you're so tired because you're a damn giver. And here's the thing, friends. It's exhausting to give a damn, isn't it? To be a person of compassion in a time and a place when compassion is in such great demand. To wake up every day and push back against predatory politicians and toxic systems and corrupt legislation and human rights atrocities and acts of treason and leadership failures in the church and your aunt who you don't understand. The volume and the relentlessness of the threats can wear you out. Have you noticed? No matter who you are, you can feel the heaviness of these days. And what happens is speed and activity can mask it. If you keep moving enough and you do enough, well, you can kind of keep that at bay. But if you stop for just a little bit and you exhale, the fatigue catches up to you. And I want to let the fatigue catch up with us today. I want us to together rest in the subtraction that comes from being a human being of compassion. Because there's a personal cost. There's a price tag to cultivating empathy in days when cruelty is trending. You're not like everybody else. That's why you're here on a beautiful day. Because you know that this is not just about a speaker. It's not just about a church. What this is about is millions of harassed and helpless and sad and scared and oppressed human beings who you know are going to be more vulnerable than ever based on what unfolds in the next few days and weeks. There is a collateral damage to giving a damn, and it manifests itself in many ways. Compassion fatigue is easy to spot. I'm going to give you some symptoms. Irritability, impatience, physical illness, emotional eating, addictive behavior, the inability to be present to people who love you, an obsession with social media, a fixation on how bad things are. I'm going to read those again. <laughs> Irritability, impatience, physical illness, emotional eating, addictive behavior, the inability to be present to people who love you, an obsession with social media, a fixation on how bad things are. Do you have any of those? Because I got them all. <laughs> when I give you those symptoms, what do you recognize in you? Tell me. Loneliness. Which of those symptoms do you recognize? Fatigue. Irritability. Irritability. Worry. Fear. Confusion. Hopelessness. Distrust of others. Feeling overwhelmed. Anger. Frustration. We're a mess. And here's the, here's the thing, friends. The answer is not you caring less. The answer is not you figuring out how to not be an empathetic person. It is to fight differently so as not to become defined or overwhelmed or consumed by the fight. So I want you to think about how you started this journey, how you began to be a person of compassion. I can remember, I say that I was 18 years old when my heart first began to bleed. Because up until that time, I had lived a fairly sheltered life in a bubble of people who loved me and people who supported me and the story of a God who was for me. And I existed in this bubble and I probably, if I had stayed there, would have been a de fairly decent human being but I had far too small a table 
for the God I said I believed in, and I had a lot of false stories about people who didn't look or talk or think or believe or worship or love the way that I did. And I say that God gave me a gift in the city of Philadelphia. And what you're saying is, how can the city of Philadelphia be a gift? I've seen those Eagles fans, they're horrible, right? <laughs> Well, I got to Philadelphia on a scholarship to study graphic design and illustration. And the way I explain it was, is if you go to a carnival and there's a, a game where there's a group of fish bowls and you have a ping pong ball and you try to throw that ping pong ball into a fish bowl. And if you get it into the fish bowl, well, you get a fish. You get a little Ziploc baggie with a fish. And when you take that fish home, if you have a tank, you can't just drop the fish in because the system shock will overwhelm the fish and you'll have a dead fish. When I arrived in Philadelphia, I was dropped from 30,000 feet into the city of brotherly love. And I lived there in the, city, in the center of the city, and I experienced diversity that I had never experienced. And I saw poverty that I had never seen. But I experienced diversity and poverty not in theological discussions, not in political debates, not in intellectual exercises, but I experienced diversity and poverty in the form of names and faces and lives and stories who I were now living alongside and had come to love. And those better stories about people changed me. And I can remember going home on that first Thanksgiving break of my freshman year and I was talking to my father who was a little bit more conservative than I was. And we were talking about, I'll say the topic was poor people and why they're poor. And my dad started in with a line of questioning and discussion, and I decided that this was my moment. And I jumped in, and I began to bulldoze him with my revelation. I began to tell him all the things I've seen and all the stuff I'd heard about and all the stories he didn't understand and all the wisdom that I'd acquired over the past two months, right? And we're talking, and he's shaking his head and laughing. And friends, if you're trying to convince someone of something and they shake their head and laugh, you're not doing well. <laughs> and he said, John, you've turned into a real bleeding heart. And I just shot back, I'd rather have a bleeding heart than a dead one, Dad. And he, the fact that I'm still here, <laughs> alive with you, means my father was far more compassionate than I gave him credit for. But the truth was, better stories had changed me. And I decided that I was going to be a, a, a person who tried to endeavor to learn the stories of other people so that I could understand the world better and be better and more useful in it. Right now you may feel, because of your story, because of the compassionate muscles that you began using, you feel a spiritual, emotional, even physical fatigue. You may be veering toward contempt or apathy or impatience. And I want to encourage you to celebrate the internal burdens that you have. I want you to celebrate the fact that you're hurting, that you're scared, that you're angry, that you're grieving, because this is all confirmation that your mind is fully right, that your heart is working properly that your faculties are intact, that you still have a soul doing what a soul is required to do, keep you deeply human in profoundly inhumane times. So if you're a wreck right now, celebrate it. I don't know if you're a Christian, doesn't matter, but my tradition has been the Christian tradition and the teachings of Jesus. And the teachings of Jesus, I'm told that Jesus is preaching and teaching and healing, and it says that he was on a hillside, and as he's doing these things, he looks at the crowd and he has compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And what I love about that story is that Jesus doesn't look at what people are doing or not doing or what they believe or don't believe. He looks at their internal condition. He looks at what the world is doing to them, and that is what moves him into the world. And I learned long ago that compassion has to be the genesis of my actions here. It has to be the source of my activism. So how can we have this compassionate heart for people and their pain? 
and not be swallowed up by it. Really quickly, I want to give you a word, a word picture. We're talking about the word compassion, and I wonder what you even think compassion is. We all have a different working idea of compassion, but did you know that the word compassion, the origination of the word is tied to the word bowels? Because it was thought in ancient times that our deepest emotions were housed near our internal organs. And so the idea was that we could be so internally disturbed by the suffering of others as to be physically altered to the point of sickness. That's why it's not inaccurate when we say that someone's story of suffering moves us. Compassion is tied to the word bowels. We're moved by compassion. So compassion is a bowel movement. If you hear nothing else, hear that today. Actually, you'll forgive me, but I said that to a group of people. Compassion is a bowel movement. And a gentleman said, that's because we give a sh. <laughs> but this is true because we know that we see things right now that make us physically ill. And right now, I know that you're carrying two things as we walked into this room. First thing you're carrying are the big picture realities that you are aware of, the systemic ills of racism and nationalism and homophobia and misogyny. You're carrying these big picture realities and they're heavy, they're overwhelming, right? And that would be enough to carry, but you're carrying something else as well. You're carrying the individual names and faces and lives and stories that those systems are affecting, right? So you've got these big picture realities and you've got these individual stories and what happens is they begin to pile up and you accumulate them in your body. And you know where they reside right now? They reside in your headache that never goes away. They reside in your clenched jaw. They reside in your elevated heart rate. They reside in the knot in the pit of your stomach that returns every day when you check the news or you turn on the TV or you step out into your community or you step out into your living room and you realize how much compassion is required of you and how little you feel you have left. So today, during the time that we have together, I wanted to share some strategies for caring for the wounds of the world and then addressing the wounds that you sustain in caring for them. The first thing I want you to think about when people, you know, often people like a talk like this, we won't have a lot of time together, you and me. And people will come up and they'll say something real quick to me as I'm walking through a church sanctuary and they'll share something deeply personal, something they may have never told anyone else. And in a few seconds, without knowing any of their backstory, they're looking for me to give them something that they can take home with them to help them. And here's what I say. Look for the fears and false stories. Look for the fears and the false stories. Find out what people are afraid of and figure out why those fears might be misplaced or better addressed because no one is at their best when they're terrified. Because what you're going to see is, I'm not going to give this message to you about people you like. This is not about compassion for people you like or love. This is about compassion for people who you find it difficult to show compassion to. Insert name here. When we're in conflict with other people, we almost always assume that we know why the person believes what they believe, whether we're debating religion or politics or finances or work problems or parenting issues or strong opinions on any topic, we seem to feel like we understand why they believe what they believe. But that's almost never true. And people's false stories and the fear that make up those false stories are gonna manifest in the politicians they support, in the religious beliefs that they hold, in the way that they respond to adversity, in the way they engage other people. And if we can look at so much of organized Christianity right now, we see that fear is the driver. The, the effort is to keep people manipulated and continually terrified of their neighbor, of the stranger, of the immigrant, of the, of the different. 
And so what we want to do is look for the fears and false stories, and we want to give people better stories, not so that they'll agree with us, but to take away their fear. And so the first thing, as you are addressing the wounds of the world and the people who you believe cause those wounds, look for those fears and those false stories. But here's what I want you to know. The goal is not for you to compromise your convictions or to live inauthentically or to soften your language or to remain silent in the face of injustice. The goal for you as compassionate people is to retain the humanity of the person in front of you who you may disagree with. So that's the first thing. Look for those fears and false stories. The second thing is hold the universal grief. I was at a speaking event in Minnesota, and a woman in the church lobby said, can I talk to you for a second? And I said, sure. And we were walking and talking, and I thought we were just going to say, like, your books are really great, which would have been you know, fine. And she started to cry, and I stopped, and she said, John, I don't like who I am anymore. She said, I hate how angry I am. I'm angry all the time. I hate how angry and hateful I've become. And I listened and I said, that's probably partly true. You might be angry right now, but you're probably something else. You're probably grieving. I said, maybe you're actually in mourning right now. And she said, I never thought about it that way, but that's it. And she began to list off the people she'd lost and the church that she'd lost and the idea of America that she'd lost. Grief and anger can look the same from the outside, right? Sometimes what seems like unmerited, unmerited rage, it's just a frustration that the heart feels and it needs to express itself in a certain way. And I don't know why you're here today, but I imagine you're here because you're grieving something that you've lost. Your idea of God or country or family. Maybe you've lost your belief in the goodness of people. Maybe you've lost the physical health that you once had. Maybe you've lost a relationship with someone you felt at home around. Maybe you've lost the lightness you used to feel. Maybe you've lost optimism for the future. I don't know what it is, but I know that if we're honest with one another, to live is to lose. And we're all grieving. But here's the catch. You're grieving, right? So are the people you love. So are the people you dislike. And so are the people you despise. There are 8 billion funerals happening simultaneously right now. And so we can look at people that it's difficult to have compassion for and realize that they probably lost something or at least are telling themselves a story that they've lost something. We can begin to soften our hearts toward them. So look for the fears and false stories and hold the universal grief. Third thing is actively confront the epidemic of loneliness. Someone mentioned that. The pandemic began and it, what it did was exacerbated a problem that already existed. We knew that people were already becoming more and more isolated. Even though social media is ever present, we feel less and less like we're seen and known and we don't know our neighbors and we don't have strong connections in our community. And we know that people feel that way, but what the pandemic did was it, it introduced geographic distance to the emotional distance that was already there. And now we have this epidemic of loneliness out there. I'm fortunate that people, like I said, tell me their stories. And what they often tell me is, I don't have a place anymore. I don't have a tribe of affinity. I don't have a people. And you think about the reason we, the best parts about living, the reason we go to the movies or read a book or look at artwork or listen to music is to see something of ourselves reflected back at us, right? To feel connected to other people. And the reason we create and express ourselves is to make that kind of connection in the reverse, to say, here's who I am, here's my story. Do we have something to connect ourselves? Most of us wade into crowds of strangers on social media every day, hoping to find people who see what we see, who ask the questions we're asking, who are burdened by what we're burdened by, who are ticked off at all that we're ticked off. I had a transformational experience about 17 years ago. I was a student pastor at the time. I was being called to my first big 
church job. This was like thousands of people in this church, and I was feeling pressure because it was like I was like the Jeffersons. I was moving on up, right? <laughs> and we had our first event, and it was at this site at an industrial park that we had rented out, and we had gaming systems, and we had a snack bar and a full basketball court and a big stage and a band and all sorts of stuff and I remember hundreds of students and their parents were there for our first big event and I was doing what I call hummingbirding see I'm an introvert and so I don't really do this well so hummingbirding is hi how are you good to see you hi nice oh, I love that hat good how are you and I can feel like I'm you know making all the contacts and there were all the people who were here and then as I was doing this I looked on the periphery of the room and there were two students standing with their backs to the wall like this. And so I made my way over through the crowd and I was talking to these two students. And I was trying to do my best youth pastor sell, you know, be like fun and cool. And, and I was telling them all the stuff we were gonna do this year and all inviting them to the trips and talking about all the plans and they were giving me nothing. And a flop sweat started to break out <laughs> And I'm trying my hardest, and I'm trying to like, get them encouraged or smile, make them smile. Nothing. So I kind of slinked away. Two days later, I got an email from one of the students, the older of the two. They were brother and sister. And the older student, she said, I don't know if you remember us, but we were at this event. And she said, we were having a terrible time because we were being forced to be there by our parents, which as a youth pastor is what you want. <laughs> You want people under duress, right? And she said, we had a really bad experience with a pastor, with our former church, and we just wanted nothing to do about that place. And she said, but you started talking to us, and it actually seemed like you cared. And she said, you made me feel visible, and I rarely feel visible. And that changed everything that I did from that day until now. Friends, people are so incredibly lonely and they want to feel visible. They want to know that someone actually sees them and has, is curious about them. You know, we're do, I'm glad some of you are here. Some of you are probably here because you said, if I can just get into a room with people, I'm just going to feel better. I'm hoping that you felt better simply by showing up, right? I was hosting a retreat in Boone, North Carolina, and I think some of you folks were even here, but the, what happened was it's, as people started to gather, it was like, you know when you plan a party and you're thinking, no one is going to show up. I'm gonna have all this potato salad by myself, and I hate potato salad to begin with. And I was really worried, and people started showing up, and they started greeting one another, and there were hugs and handshakes, and there was this a complete affinity right from the beginning, and we're saying hello, and all of, a sudden, all of a sudden the door bursts open, boom, a woman comes in, and she looks around, and she goes, my people! I said, you're in the wrong room. I'm sorry. Your people are actually down the hall. But she knew enough about the writing that she thought, I will be welcomed here, and my people will be there. Here's why this epidemic of loneliness matters to you as compassionate people. If we think about the need for the pull of community, we can begin to understand what motivates us, but what motivates other people? How can so many people fall in line with hateful movements? How can people become attached to communities that seem to be built on exclusion? How can so many people who claim they love Jesus be part of a predatory Christianity? Well, the reason is, that that community or that movement or a group of people make them feel like they belong, make them feel like they're part of something, give them identity, even if that identity is conditional. And even if that identity and that community is predatory even to them, it doesn't matter because they want to feel seen and heard and loved. Loneliness is often at the heart of despair, and community is the antidote to that. Community makes us feel less alone. So it's important to know that we do this work of compassion individually and we do it collectively. We do it interpersonally and then we do it systemically and try to address the reasons why so many people find a home in places that are harmful toward them. Because this is the truth. No one is immune from the collateral damage of being human, right? Again, not liberals or conservatives not Democrats or Republicans, not Christians or non-Christians. We are all susceptible to feeling like we are the last 
of an endangered species that no one cares about what we care about. No one knows what we know. No one is burdened. No one is twisted in our bowels. See, that's a phrase when I tend to compassion is related to the word bowels. There's this phrase, I'm twisted in my bowels, and I wonder what twists you in your bowels. So, I want you to consider the universal grief out there. I want you to look at the fears and false stories. I want you to fight the epidemic of loneliness. And there, I want you to be a story learner. For the past 25 years, I've called my neighborhood. We all have a neighborhood where we exist, where we live, where we do our work, where we get to know people, where we live in community, where we build relationships. There is a neighborhood, a geography of our lives. My neighborhood for the past 25 years has been the church as a pastor, predominantly white churches in the South. Now our churches were all diverse. Just look at our website, it says we're a diverse church. <laughs> but the reality was we spanned the racial diversity from white to beige and everything in between. But often we aspire to diversity, but we didn't know why we weren't diverse. And as I think about being a learner of story, I have to confess that as a pastor, a speed bump happened in my life when I realized that there are fewer entities in America that have been more powerful agents of inequity than the Christian church, along lines of race and gender and sexual orientation and socioeconomic level. As often as religion has bent the moral arc of the universe toward justice, it's bent it away. And what I began to do as a pastor was saying, I need to learn the stories of people who don't look like me, who don't worship like me. I need the stories of people who are not in the building where I reside. And as I began doing that, I realized that those stories, as I told you in Philadelphia, they changed me. Here's what I think we do to people we don't like, we disagree with. We say, I know their story. I look at their bumper sticker, I know their story. Look at how they vote, I know their story. Look at the TV shows they watch, I know their story. We don't. We know what's in front of us, but we don't know what preceded us, right? And there is so much complexity behind the whys of who we all are. And so what I need us to do, and I think the world needs us to do, is to get in a posture of curiosity that says, I'm not going to assume what you believe. I'm not going to assume why you believe it. I'm going to actually ask you. Because that posture of curiosity is going to make us more approachable. It's going to make us softer. Now, what does that mean? Well, it could mean a lot of difficulty for you. Here's how. My friend Susan after the 2016 election, she said, John, I'm so disheartened by this world. I, I'm so upset by the divisions and people aren't talking to one another. Exactly. And she, she said, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, I mean, it could be just about getting to know people you don't know. And she said, huh. And the next week she said, you know what I'm gonna do, John? I decided I'm gonna invite women over to my home every weekend, every Sunday, I'm going to have women over for lunch, and we're going to play bridge, and these are going to be people who are theologically and politically the opposite of me. And I said, better you than me, lady. <laughs> I was like, I gave you the wisdom, I nudged you, and go for it. Now, I'm sure what you're all thinking is, wow, that's brave of Susan, and that must have been beautiful. No. <laughs> it was quite terrible. She used to come into where I was speaking and she'd go, she'd have the newspaper, she'd go, did you see what happened this week in the news? Because if you still pray, would you pray for me? Because I have to deal with this in my home on Sunday with these women. <laughs> but you know, as frustrating as it's been for Susan, she told me that there are moments of hope now. And she told me this story where they were talking about the racial divide in the country and the woman started to tear up and she started to cry. And my friend said, well, why are you crying? And the woman said, well, I just don't know why God made other races. No, right? 
See, if I had been there and a 70-year-old white woman had said, I don't know why God made other races, I would have probably said, you know, if Ab Adam and Eve were real, they weren't Caucasian, right? <laughs> or I would have said, the cradle of civilization did not come with a cracker barrel, hallelujah. <laughs> but I didn't, you know, I wasn't there, and Susan was much kinder and more wise than me, and Susan said this elemental question. Could you tell me more? And the woman said, well, if God had only made one race, then there would be no division and we would all get along. So I don't know why God went and made other races. I hope you hear what happened in that moment. Because my friend Susan realized it. This woman across from her was genuinely grieving the fracture she was seeing in society. But she had a really bad story about why they existed. She was seeing herself as the default of race, and there was extra other than whiteness, and that was a flawed perspective, obviously. But she was genuinely grieving. She wasn't a bad person. She was a good person with a bad story. And friends, when we learn people's story, that's what we often realize. Many of us came out of a bad story of some kind. Many Christians have been weaned on a bad story, right? Their God is actually too small. In many ways, evangelical religion is built on the, an inequitable theology, on the fraudulent premise that God is a cisgender white guy who was born in America, raised Christian, and votes Republican. And if that is your God's story, where you're going to naturally harbor resentment toward people who don't fit that criteria. And so... What Susan did and what we need to do is have proximity to people so that we can learn their stories, so we can find out how to be better stewards of our relationship with them. I went to art school. I studied graphic design and illustration. And one day we were getting ready to draw a still life. And there was this assortment of items on a table. And we started getting all our stuff together to start drawing. And my instructor said, before we start, put all your pencils down and come up here. And he got us really close to this ordinary group of things. And he said, these are ordinary objects that people have lost sight of the beauty in. He said, your job as the artist is to show people the beauty in things they no longer see. And he said, the only way you're going to do that is you have to get close to it. And you pick it up and you feel, is it cold or is it warm? Is it rough or is it smooth? What's its weight? How does the light interact with it? He said, you become a student of what you draw. And once you do that, once you become a student of what you draw, then you can go and share the beauty in it that no one sees. We need to become students of the people in our path. Even if people don't care to know our stories, we have to be curious about theirs. So be a story learner. And the fifth thing, I would need you to be honest about your own lenses. I went to, uh, we took the kids to Universal Studios, Florida. You know how those trips go, right? You wait, you save up, you get up really early in the morning, you get in the car, you go to the airport, you get on a plane, you get off the plane, you go to a tram, you get on a bus, you go to the hotel, you get another bus, you go to the park so that you can ride a vehicle of some sort, and you're so exhausted by the time you get there. So we got to Universal Studios, and the first thing we decided to do at the time was this, it was called Shrek 4D. It was a 3D movie, basically, but they splash you with water, they move your chair, they push, blow air at you, and it's supposed to be experiential. You get 3D, you know. So we get to this Shrek 4D, we get ushered into our seats, we're exhausted, they give us these little yellow plastic 3D glasses, the house lights go down, it says, put on your 3D glasses, so I do, and as the movie starts, the presentation starts, and I'm not impressed. It doesn't have the clarity I thought it should have, it wasn't as, you know, earth shaking as I thought it would be with the price point and all that we've done to get there. And I started looking around and thinking maybe there's a technical error and everyone else was having a great time. So I'm like, well, of course, because their standards are much lower than mine, right? <laughs> and I looked to my wife who can usually mirror my displeasure and things like this. And she's having a great time. And I said, well, who can account for her taste? She married me, right? <laughs> and so I, I endure this subpar entertainment experience and the house lights come up and my wife goes, what's that on top of your head? And I said, what? And I reach up and I look, and there's yellow 3D glasses. And then I go like this, and I realize what I had done is watch the whole movie with my non-prescription sunglasses on. 
So as you can imagine, my wife is long suffering, you know? <laughs> and I said, can we go again? <laughs> so we walk around, we go through the queue again, we get our glasses, we sit down, I put the 3D glasses on, and the house lights go down, the movie starts, and you know what, it was awesome. <laughs> so realistic. But the lenses through which we view the world matter, right? As we live in community alongside disparate people, it's tempting to imagine that everyone sees things the same way that we do, that their filters match our own, that we are having a similar experience of the same planet or the same country or the same religion, even the same Jesus. But the truth is we each have incredibly specific story-shaped lenses through which we view the world. And these lenses are formed by the families in which we are raised, the churches we were a part of or not a part of, our life experience, our very physicality, all shaped the precise way that we experience the world, right? That's why caring about anything is so difficult because there are 8 billion separate stories all colliding, and that's a lot of relational friction. And here's the other problem. Anyone who claims Christianity, they all make God slightly or substantially in their own image. Even when we look at the scriptures, because of those lenses, we all view the Bible through lenses that the words of Jesus are going to naturally agree with our politics or ratify our prejudices or affirm our beliefs, right? We're all going to skew things our way. And what I've always realized is that if I say the word Jesus and there are a hundred people who believe in Jesus, I'm going to have a hundred different, highly personalized, customized, partially incomplete Jesuses. That's why church is such a mess. Because we've all got to get together and figure out which Jesus do we perpetuate here. Part of what we need to do as people of compassion is to realize I am not seeing life objectively. I am seeing through the lens of the home in which I was raised and the church that I was a part of and the story that I've walked through. And as much as other people are manipulated by their fears, I'm manipulated by mine. And as much as people are grieving and that's affecting them, I'm grieving. As lonely as that person is that made him embrace hate, I am just as lonely. And so as we learn story and we're, and we're more cognizant of our lenses, I think we're going to be softer toward people. So this is some stuff I want you to think about regarding the wounds of the world, right? Look for the fears and the false stories. Hold the universal grief. Confront the epidemic of loneliness. Be a story learner and be honest about your lenses. But here's what I want to stop and we're going to take a break and talk. All of this stuff that I've been sharing does not mean you need to agree with people. It does not mean you need to be silent in the face of injustice. It doesn't mean you have to soften your language. It doesn't mean you have to compromise your principles. It means as you do this, you embrace the best of who you are so that you can express exactly what you're in opposition to in a way that's humane and loving. So I've been talking for a while, friends. I would like you to talk now. I'm gonna, we're going to get the microphone. What I'd love to know is, what are you thinking about? Frustrated by? Encouraged by? Noticing about yourself? Or a question that you have? Or just a place you want to disagree with me? Well, if you want to disagree with me, just go outside. <laughs> just, just comment on my social media. No, what's on your mind? Let's share, because here's the thing. You could hear me talk like this anytime online. This is a time for us to be together in real time and have a conversation about the deepest contents of our hearts. So what's on your mind today? Hello, welcome to our church. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, the, the way that I usually navigate family and group get-togethers or if we're traveling, we stop at friends' houses who I know are not on the same page um, with either Christianity or just the way they feel about things. Yeah. Is I usually say, 
right away, um, just so you know, this is, and this happened during the whole election year of 2016, we were traveling, and so we were, with, we were with all kinds of people. And I would say, just so you know, this is how I voted, we're gonna agree to disagree. So let's not talk about it the rest of the day. Now, it feels like a cop-out, you know? Yes. So, and, but I didn't know how to go any farther because I was so um, filled with disillusionment and anger and yes. frustration that I didn't want to go anywhere else. So I guess I'm wondering what you feel about that phrase, agree to disagree, because I've had friends say to me, you don't agree to disagree. You try to get them to agree with you. <laughs> and it's like, I don't think I can do that, at least not at that time. Right, okay, the, the phrase uh, agree to disagree, I believe it's from the devil. No, no, no. Um, here's what, you're, what you're sharing is natural. Right? We, we can only endure so much turbulence or so much relational discord, and there are times when we need a rest from it. And so in certain relationships or situations, it's understandable to say, okay, let's lay some ground rules. We don't agree on some of these things, so let's not let's stay in that place of turmoil. And it, it's, it's, it's fine, right? But here's what I would say is often I'm going to say to people, I don't want us to agree to disagree. I want to keep pressing into what we disagree about because I need, we need to get to a place that's, that's deeper than this. Because the danger is we end up living with the people we should have the most authentic relationships with and we live in the surface. So my friends and my family, I want us to wrestle with these things because this should be the place where I can do that. Or the church. Our church should be the place where we can be the fullest most authentic version of ourselves. And if we say, let's not go there, what we're saying is that that water is too deep. And so once in a while, it's good to say, let's go a little deeper and see what happens. Now, here's why I want to paint a picture for you. Because if you were to say to your friend who is more conservative, let's say, and you say to them, I'm going to tell you there are four people named Maria. They are all of the same inherent value. And they would probably say, well, sure, of course. If they're Christian, they'll go, yeah, they're all made in the image of God, four Marias, yes. And then you say, well, okay, one of these Marias, in your case, is your friend or your neighbor or your aunt, Maria. The other Maria is a transgender teenager in Missouri. The other Maria is a migrant at the border. And the other Maria is a woman who lives in Iran. Now, is what happens is we usually err on the side of making this Maria happy, not ticking off this Maria, so we make peace and we're quiet, right? Or we stop talking about things. Meanwhile, the other Marias are over here saying, I need to be represented in this conversation because they might not hear about me in any other way than through your voice. Does that make sense? So sometimes what compassionate people, we're always gonna be in the tension of our convictions and our relationships. Sometimes we're gonna fight for the relationship. Sometimes we're gonna to try to stay. Sometimes we're gonna to try to navigate around those people. But other times we have to say, you know what, this is just what I believe deeply about this and I am not gonna rest about it. And for me, that means sometimes the relationships are the collateral damage of living authentically. Because in my case, I was, uh, I was the pastor at a church and I decided I'm gonna say everything. I'm going to speak around this. I'm going to make, I'm not going to speak around it. I'm going to make uncomfortable church services, right? And then I started at a new church. And as I tell people, only five months into my time at that church, I heard God calling me to leave that church. And it came in the form of my pastor's voice saying, you're fired. <laughs> because the truth was I had troubled the waters. But then a couple of weeks later, I wrote a blog post called If I Have Gay Children. And I stated unequivocally, that I didn't believe being gay was a sin. What happened for me was those words reach millions of people and they represent thousands, if not millions of people who heard of their value from a pastor. But the only way I was able to have the courage to speak with that specificity was after loosening the tethers to my old church. That may be true about your relationships. Maybe those relationships are worth saving but maybe they're all gonna be the cost of you moving into a new space so that you can create a community around you that welcomes all people. So all that to say, I don't know. 
because what, what we have to realize is every relationship is so specific, every instance. So my Aunt Maria, for example, some days I feel benevolent toward her. Or some days I'm just humble enough and I remember her story and I can lean in and keep going. But sometimes what Maria, Aunt Maria is saying is so toxic to me and it's making me so angry that I have to distance myself. So both tactics are right. It just depends on the who and the when, I think. What else is on your mind? What are you thinking about? Hi, thank you for coming. Make us all feel better, for sure. Um, after the 2016 election, my adult children were very upset. And I remember my husband talking to them and saying, why are you fearful? Why are you fearful? Tell me why you're fearful. And they talked about what they fear would happen. And he said, well, that's not going to happen. Look at history. Look at this. Many of their fears have happened. Yeah. So I would like you to address that and talk about that a little bit. Well, if my wife were here, she would tell you that I'm a pessimist. I don't like that term. I like to say that I'm prepared for the worst case scenario. <laughs> I like to be emotionally and physically ready when it all hits the fan so that I can have a, a direction to go. And I have often been the person saying, this is gonna be really bad and here are the things that are gonna happen, right? And the last couple of years, I felt pretty confident about myself now. I said, see, see, see? But the truth is this, um, I'm gonna share some words in a minute when we, when we close together, but the important thing is to realize that as the most horrifying things have happened and are happening, still here we are, right? Still here we are being damn givers, being people who want to learn story, who want to bridge difference, who want to fight for justice. And so that is simply the reality. The reality is, yes, there are bad things happening, but part of what the challenge is, and I'll share in just some tips for you, um, hold that thought for just five seconds, but I wanna give you something and I'll refer back to you in a second. I wanna make sure I hear a couple people who aren't me talking. Hi. Hi. Um, it, it's funny how many things refer back to 2016. <laughs> but um, I guess my question probably starts about then. But I, I found myself, and actually a lot of people that I know, have a really hard time referring to ourselves as Christian anymore. Yes. Because that pegs us as a certain thing. Do you have any suggestions or just some validation? Maybe I. I would love to be able to not have to have a caveat after I say that word. Okay, so Christian, and you're having trouble even claiming that name uh, anymore, and what I could first tell you is you're in great and massive company. Um, m most of the people who encounter my work, many of them say, I came out of that place, or I, I have lost that tribe of affinity because I no longer fit there. And what I try to do is realize that I can't own the legacy of Christianity. All I can do is express my personal belief system and embody that as best I can. So in some ways, some days I say, yes, I'm a Christian. Some days I keep that quiet and just try to follow the teachings of Jesus. And so the encouragement would be, whatever it is that twists you in your bowels, whatever you look at the world with the compassion, operate in that and then don't feel like you have to name it or don't feel obligated to, to hide from it. It's gonna be about you saying, like for me, I wanna be an expectation to find Christian. I want people to go, wait, you're a Christian and you're not this? So I want to both affirm my, my search spiritually and I want to embody that search in a way that is so counterintuitive based on what everyone's evidence has been. I was talking to a woman she identified as a queer agnostic of color. And I was online saying, listen, this thing, this hateful thing that you're worried about, this isn't Christianity, right? And I thought I was making a good pitch. And she said, John, you know what? Actually, it is Christianity. It's the only Christianity that I've experienced. She said, the hatred and the closed-mindedness, she said, you're the weirdo, you're the outlier. He said, your heresy is why I love you, right? And so she was trying to help me understand that I was unexpected. And all we can do is be that beautiful surprise for people. Um, here. 
be right there with this one coming back. Hi, I just Hi. wanted to kind of share uh, in similar, similar relation to what she had said, a very close friend of mine has been really going through a turmoil and a struggle with her faith and her home church because of what she hears, you know, coming from the pulpit every Sunday, what she's heard all her life. Yeah. And about six months ago, her son came out as transgender. And so it's been a huge struggle for her. And she, uh, I just wanted to share that I shared a lot of your writings with her, your book, uh, specifically your book, Stuff That Needs To Be Said. And something she found in there gave her so much peace. And she texted me late last night and said that if I got to meet you today, she wanted me to make sure and tell you that you are the reason that she can open the Bible again. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, I shared this yesterday, but to me, hearing that and knowing the platform that I've been given, it's a pretty large platform now, and I don't say that to have you go, look at how impressive. I don't think that's confirmation of my writing. I think what it is, it's an indication of how many people out there are asking the questions we're asking, are struggling with what we're struggling with, and are burdened by what we're burdened by. And it's such an honor that through that journey that I can connect with another person's life. I mean, that's that's the whole point of this, right? So that, that's the other part about this. You, you don't require a large readership to do this work. You don't require a social media platform. You don't, the world doesn't need a jerk, another jerk blogger. Like here I am, right? That job is taken. But we each, where we each, where we are in the small, the here, the now, the close, the doable, this is what we do. We change people with, that are in proximity to us. So I'm just grateful that technology brought us proximity. Tell her thank you. John, my name is John also, but I read a lot of uh, authors, conservative uh, Christian authors, uh, liberal Christian authors, and every time I read those, I don't say I get more confused, but I begin to realize the diversity people have in terms of how they view Jesus, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, there's an argument about Jesus being the Son of God, uh, and there's an argument about Jesus being God. This whole idea of the Trinity. I won't get into all that theology, but I guess my question is to you as a Christian, what has Jesus served to you as a role model? What, what about Jesus makes you act the way you do? Is it the belief that Jesus has the doctrinal stuff about Jesus or, or Jesus, uh, the approach they had towards people? If that makes any sense to you. It, it, oh, it absolutely does. Thank you. Well, for me, there have been times, I was raised um, Roman Catholic, so I was raised on gluten and guilt, right? <laughs> Pasta, repentance. And, I, and at that time, I had this giant idea of God, but also this, super, you know, this supernatural cosmic thing that was felt both loving and I was, I was terrified of it. And there, but I had the theology that I was supposed to have, but then I had God who made everything and loved me completely, but yet I was afraid of. And so I jettisoned some of that when I got to be a little bit older, and then I started to look at, okay, what were the teachings of Jesus? And if I try to embody those teachings, what would be the net result on my life and the lives around me? And so that's how I started this journey of leaning into um, the stories of Jesus and what I call the table, the table ministry of Jesus. All the ways and places in the scriptures where he shared a meal with someone and the breaking of bread with someone, to use that as a time to let them know they were seen and heard and loved. And so I always go back to that, and there's this great story. If you're not a Christian, I'll summarize it in 90 seconds. Um, all four biographers of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, share this. Uh, Jesus is on a hillside praying or teaching, and like most preachers, he's gone long, right? And it's getting late, and it's getting dark, and his students say, Jesus, listen, it's getting late, you're going long, you've preached so long that Chick-fil-A is now closed, there's nowhere for these people to eat, and they have to eat, so they say, would you feed them? And Jesus says, you feed them. And they begin to say, well, wait a minute, all these people, and he says, what do you have? 
and they collect whatever they can, ha what they have, and the writer said, there's some bread and some fish, and they, they give it to Jesus, and he multiplies it, right? He feeds thousands. I used to read that story as a how story, because I wanted the, the Jesus, the supernatural cosmic Jesus, and figure out, well, how does that happen? But then what I started to do was read that story as a who and a what and a why story. The who was Jesus, the what was Jesus feeds people, and the why is because they were hungry. And that's really what I began to try and, and live out, because here's where I, what I believe. Your theology only exists relationally. It doesn't matter what you believe or say you believe or pray that you believe or sing that you believe if the people in your path do not encounter what you believe. So I wanted a relational theology that I'm embodying. So that's what I do. I rest in that. When I don't know anything else, I feed people and I see them as harassed and helpless. Over there. Thanks. I want to refer back to the previous person, I think it was, maybe two back. Um, coincidentally, this afternoon in 45 minutes, the new uh, Michigan United Church of Christ Conference minister is being installed, Dr. Reverend Dr. Lillian Daniels, and she wrote a book, one of her many books is um, Tired of Apologizing for the Church I Don't Belong To, and it's on this whole question of what Christian are you? Excellent. So I, I recommend that to you. Great, thank you for that, yes. And, and you know, when I, when I was, um, I don't like to say fired. I was released. That's what the religious term. We released you. Well, thank you. Um, you released me from my paycheck and health insurance. Thank you for that. Um, what I woke up, I told the story yesterday that I woke up after 17 years and I, the first Sunday that I didn't have a church to go to and I was grieving that until I realized the, the great gift that that was that I no longer had to represent anyone else's faith convictions but my own. I could ask anything and say everything, and, and once you get that gift, you don't want to give it up, and I would say that would be the way we should live. We should ask the questions and lean into the answers that we find and say, that's enough. I don't need to agree with anyone or for them to agree with me, because ultimately, remember those lenses. My Jesus is very different than your Jesus. Hi. Um, you mentioned something about whenever we feel like we're hurting too much for or not too much, but hurting for um, those who are at the margins, we should celebrate our hurt. Um, and I was just wondering, how do we make sure that that celebration doesn't turn into something like a savior complex? Because yes. to me, it seems like if I am not the oppressed, um, feeling hurt for someone who is oppressed, it's the least I can do. Mm. Great question. So the question is basically, how can we lean into and celebrate the fact that we care deeply and, and that's a sign that we're, uh, that we're doing something that is for humanity without neglecting people because, because it's, a, it's an option for us. It's a reminder of our privilege, right, that we can stop and rest and congratulate ourselves. And what I always will tell people is that if you're ever tired of living with urgency, realize that there are people who have urgency because they have no other choice, right? That, that urgency is a part of their default system. So that's a, a definite danger. What I would say is this. One of, the, one of the things we can do as caregivers, as lovers of humanity, as activists, as ministers, is that we can get the mindset that we aren't able to stop and rest. And I'll quickly transition to just a couple things I would ask you to do. Remember, these were about the wounds of the world, about the grief and the fear and the false stories. But when it comes to you, one of the things I would... Uh, ask you to think about is how can I say this we often fight as compassionate people for the idea of a life that we stop living because we're so busy fighting in other words I know people in this room who are so committed to their activism that they aren't getting time with their families or their spouses are being neglected or their partners aren't seeing them or their physical health is suffering. And so what people can begin to do is the opposite of that is have an arrogance that says, well, I can't stop because look at how many people need me. And the truth is when we pull away and rest, 
One of the things I tell people to do is engage and withdraw. It's a two-step dance. Jesus did that, right? So Jesus is preaching, teaching, and healing, and he's doing all this stuff on the, on the hillside. But right before that, they can't find him. Well, there's all these stories about Jesus in the Gospels where they can't find him, and he's in a solitary place praying. He's stopping to recalibrate and rest and find nature and silence and solitude, not because it's a betrayal of the work, but because he can then go back to the work and have eyes that see with compassion. So what I would say to you is, and to all of us is we want to be the most whole, healthy human beings we can so that we can do this work for longer and we can do it better. The idea is not becoming martyrs of our hearts and saying, look how hard I have to work. For years, frankly, my wife and kids got the leftovers of me because I was doing the activism, I was doing the work of Jesus. And then I had to realize the work of Jesus is also ministering to the people around me who love me. And the part that I won't, don't want you to miss is that, yes, compassion for the world, but compassion for self is important. Because, you know that story I said, Jesus looked at the crowds and they were harassed and helpless? Sometimes we have to admit that we're harassed and helpless. So I won't want you to neglect you. I don't want you to, I don't want your health to die on the altar of your compassion. So it's a balance all the time of the need and of our, I would want you to remember who you aren't in this work. You are a once in history, never to be repeated creation with gifts and talents and a story, but you are not infinite in your resources. You are finite, and so eventually the goal is not you expiring early. The goal is you staying here for a long time and doing this work. So we balance the need and our need. Yeah, great question, though. Thank you. A couple others? Well, you mentioned the feeding of the 5,000 because there's another story. And that's the story of this man that was deranged. He was not in control of himself. And Jesus came on the scene. What happened? He was cured. And what did this person want to do? He wanted to go with Jesus. And what did Jesus say to him? I want you to stay here. I want you to tell others what being with me has done. Right. <laughs> Amen. That's it. Thank you. So <laughs> that story is for us, each one of us. Yeah. And it's simple. We can love everyone. In the beginning, God finished the creation. And what did he say? It is good. Amen. That means everything is good. Thank you. One, one, one more. <laughs> Every one of us are free. Our sins are forgiven. Every one of us. How do we know? Christ died for every one of us. Thank you. So how can you feel bad? You gotta be filled with love. Thank you, thank you for that. I think the, the question becomes, we, we talked in, in the church service today about the turbulence of the world. And while all those things are true, some people are experiencing the shaking of being human in a way that all others of us might not be. And so it's just always being aware that, yes, goodness, I believe love has the last loudest word, but I believe we are to be the ones to speak it. So we don't, you know, they say the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends toward justice, right? Well, we are the arc benders. So we don't just say, you know what, it's great. No, what we do is we step into the world and we get into the jagged, messy trenches of people's lives and we say the love that you believe in, 
you embody it where you are for sure all right let's do one more and then what i'll do is i'll close us and then if anyone wants to stay we can hang out and we can talk more and um i only have about 45 more minutes no i'm kidding i'm not scary john sir we all have family and friends neighbors who are on the other side of the political divide the other side of the rational divide now, I know you've been talking about this and given pieces all the way through your presentation, but would you summarize for us, please, the mindset, what is going on in, in the other side that we need to understand and how to deal with it? Uh, wow. <laughs> That's all the time we have. <laughs> you know, there's no way to summarize something that complex, but I will say this. I will go back to the first thing that I said. Look for the fears and false stories. The worst, religion at its worst, politics at its worst, presses the buttons of fear and prejudice in people over and over again until they're perpetually terrified. And what I have to realize is that when I encounter a person on social media or in my living room or in my neighborhood who is hateful or at least believe something that's hateful, I have to realize that there was a process by which it was created in them and that it seems right and good to them. Here's the secret. No one thinks they're a bad person. No one wakes up and says, I'm going to be exclusionary or hateful or racist. Everyone's story in their head says, my motives are pure, my cause is just, and my actions are right. Right? Even the people we disagree with. So part of our, the wisdom in what we do in having empathy is saying, I know they're telling themselves a story of their own goodness. The challenge is, can I show them the result of their actions and invite their humanity into that space? So I can't tell someone, you're hateful or you're terrible. I can, but it's not going to be as successful as if I say, I want you to see the result of your religious belief. I want you to see the result of your the legislation you support. I want you to see the result on a family. I want you to tell you a story and I want to give you a chance to be human in the face of that. So the best way to summarize it is to try and get into the head of a person because we all tell ourselves a story that we're the good person. And we are the only ones who are right. No, like so I was at an event, a woman got up. Would you mind standing up for me? Just, just turn to these lovely people. I just want to use a visual aid because that we are at an event, this is brilliant bedazzlement, right? Thank you, thank you. We were at a gathering in a Unitarian church in rural Georgia, the reddest of the red area that you could get. And a woman with a, a, a denim jacket with all sorts of buttons on it stood up and she grabbed the microphone during this time. And she said, John, sometimes we just have to say right is right and wrong is wrong and we have right on our side and we've got to fight for it because those people are winning and we can't let them win and everyone's cheering right and i said okay i agree with you i know why we're opposing what we're opposing i know what we stand for and i believe it's good but i said there's also a bizarro gathering of this one across town at a conservative church with a conservative pastor with a woman with very different buttons on her jacket and she's just grabbed the microphone and said John right is right and wrong is wrong and we have to fight for what's right because they're wrong and we're right so here's the point we can't have a progressive arrogance that says look how enlightened we are and look at how abysmal they are and because the, the greatest temptation I've had as a progressive Christian is to hold a grudge against people who don't who believe what I used to believe and I don't want to try and elevate myself above them I may feel like I've seen some things that they haven't seen that's all the more reason I have to share what I've seen I got the time in Philadelphia they didn't get it I got to live overseas they didn't have it so that's a little bit of our, our, our posture toward people has to be that Okay, here's what I'll say. I've got about five hours of things I'd like to share with you in about three minutes. So here, I didn't want to leave without just giving you a couple of those ideas about how to care for yourself. So that engaging and withdrawing is important. And I also want you to um, 
wisely use social media. Here's what I mean. I want you to get on social media as compassionate people because what social media at its best does, it allows you to find your tribe of affinity because we would not be together without social media. The fact that we are together right now is just due to the fact that social media exists. So we get on there, we find our tribe of affinity, we can stay informed about what's happening in the world, and we can use that platform to perpetuate goodness and to speak truth. So do those things over and over again, but then to preserve yourself as an empathetic person, get off social media. Because social media at its worst, it artificially enlarges the bad news. Because you wake up and you see a story about a piece of legislation or a political movement or about some event or some church and you share that because you want to keep people informed. And what happens is people like it or they retweet it or they comment on it and you get another notification and you see it again and you see your friend sharing it. And all of a sudden you've seen that story like 15 times and you multiply that by four or five stories. And what happens is by the time 9 a.m. comes, you are so inundated with bad news that you've artificially enlarged the threat. And so I want you to get off social media from time to time to right-size the threats. It doesn't mean they don't exist and it doesn't mean we ignore them. It means we don't give them more power than they should have. So I want you to do that. And I also would like you to um, cultivate, first I want you to sort of take what I would call hope inventory. Look in the world every day and think about the things that give you hope for humanity. People doing beautiful acts of generosity, organizations you're working with, faith communities. Take note of those things. Intentionally ponder them. Dwell on them. Because what hope does is it propels us into the future, right? It moves us into a day that we would not otherwise walk into. November 8th is coming. Don't know if you know about it. It's kind of important. That's the other five hours I wish I could share with you. It's really important, but you know what's just as important, if not more important? Wednesday, November 9th, because you're gonna wake up in a world and it's gonna require your empathy more than ever. You're gonna still have the systemic ills that you already know exist. You're still gonna have the relational fractures that you've experienced. You're still gonna have people perpetuating injustice and you're gonna have to step into it. So give that, cultivate that, that hope so that you can keep going but then i want you to also cultivate gratitude because gratitude friends is present focused hope is the future gratitude says even if nothing changed even if everything was exactly as it is what is still worthy of celebrating it's important for you and for me to cultivate gratitude because what we often miss in this work because you're so caring and because you're so adept at seeing suffering it means you're often unable to rest from the sheer volume of the suffering. And so cultivating gratitude can say, you know what, as much work as there is to do, there is beauty and there is goodness present always. And one other thing I would have you do is I'd have you share the load of this work. Um, community is medicinal. I hope you experienced that. I hope you walked in here and you were just able to exhale and you said, my people. So um, I have a, a good friend, and his name is um, Rod, and I was Rod's guest at his home in Santa Rosa, California. Amazing, massive house, and I was treated like, uh, you know, a treasured guest there, and had a wonderful experience, and had a gathering of people like this in his home. And a couple of years ago, Rod lost his home in the wildfires there. And I was talking to him the next day. And he said, John, it was crazy. He said, it was 2.15 in the morning. We are awakened out of a sound sleep. We had 15 minutes. We saved what we could. We left. And the whole place was gone. It was ash in the morning. Everything was gone. But he had this phrase. He said, we saved what we could. And this is the heart of what it means to be a human being of empathy, friends. What I love about the story of Jesus feeding the multitudes is that they say, Jesus, look at all these people. There are thousands. We can't feed them. And Jesus says, what do you have? And they say, well, it's just some bread and fish. That's enough. Give it to me. And the idea of saving what we can, and you're saying, John, I can't change these political realities of our nation. What do you have? Do you have a couple hours to volunteer locally? 
Do you have your vote? That's enough. Save what you can. John, I, I see how hateful Christianity is toward the LGBTQ community. It feels overwhelming. It is. What do you have? Do you have access to a local faith community where you can live out your values? Can you, do you have Christians in your life who you can talk to about with these things and maybe change one mind? Do you have one gay teenager that you know who you can encourage? Save what you can. John, I'm so overwhelmed by gun violence and I don't know what to do and it makes me sick. What do you have? Do you have time to, to be part of an organization that supports people? Do you have time to fight legislation? That's enough. Save what you can. There are two stories in your head. There is the big and the distant that will always overwhelm you. The systems will always overwhelm you. What I want you to do is lean down and look at the stories. Look in your local community, in the places you travel, in the people you know, in the organizations that you're a part of, and realize there is agency that I have here. There is always small, here, now, close, doable, right? So, beautiful day out there. With your gifts, with your talents, with your privilege, with your circles of influence, with your money, with your time, with everything that you have, as small as it may be, wield it with decency and goodness and love and compassion and simply save what you can. It's been an honor to be with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh gosh, no, thank you. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Um, so, so I'll head back there, I'll sign some books, we'll hang out, and, um, and the rest of you enjoy your day. Thank you so much.